Hello, hello. I'm going to do another live stream. It's, what is it? It's Monday evening. So I just made a video about Benjamin Netanyahu getting arrested. <laughs> no, no, sorry, he's not arrested. Uh, the ICC, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, issued an arrest warrant for Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, and also his Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant. Okay. Uh, I already made I just made a video about it. Uh, the fact that, remember when Putin wasn't allowed to visit South Africa to attend the BRICS summit there? Yeah, so South Africa is the S in the BRICS nations. And South Africa is the one that filed the uh, request for the prosecution of Benjamin Netanyahu. And they succeeded. This is very interesting because previously the United States had used the ICC or pushed the ICC to issue the arrest warrant for Putin. Remember one or two years back when the war started, Putin was slapped with an international arrest warrant by the same ICC. Uh, they said that the, he had, Putin had allegedly put children in concentration camps. And now we realize that <laughs> Putin is... Uh, I've noticed this, by the way, that Putin always plays tit for tat. His strategy is tit for tat. Putin has studied, studied game theory. And in game theory, there is a winning strategy called tit for tat. If you play tit for tat, you are most likely to, uh, to win the game in the long run. So it's, it's a long run, long term strategy. Over the long run, you will win that way. And what that means is in practice, every time when the West tries to slap or hit Putin in some way or Russia in some way or form, Putin will do almost the exact same thing in return. Uh, so imagine if, uh, if you would, uh, assassinate the daughter of uh, Dugin or someone, he would, uh, return the favor. Or if you slap him with a international arrest warrant, he will get you, he will have revenge by doing the same to you. So that's why Benjamin, Benjamin Netanyahu now has, uh, an arrest warrant by the ICC. This will limit, I, I presume will limit Netanyahu's uh, range of motion. He won't be able to travel to the EU, perhaps, because United, because the ICC is seated in the European Union, in, in The Hague and the Netherlands. How on earth is the EU going to continue supporting Israel? I mean, Israel was at the Eurovision Song Festival, where, where Joost Klein uh, put some pressure on the Israeli singer, asking her, like, why she didn't want to answer a question about her endangering other participants at the festival since the crowds were booing Israel the whole time. This is truly amazing that Israel was even allowed to participate at the Eurovision Song, Eurovision Song Festival while they were genociding people in Gaza. I have no doubt that it is genocide. Indeed, the ICC arrest warrant calls it war crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes against humanity or so, genocide. Uh, I think that's really, truly, um, yeah, crucial here. The EU, Ursula von der Leyen, Joseph Borrell, you don't know who these people are, right? We, we in Europe, we know who Joe Biden is. But I suppose you Americans, if you're watching, if Americans are watching, I don't think you know who Ursula von der Leyen is. She's the chief bitch of the EU, apparently. <laughs> uh, along with uh, other people, Joseph Borrell, I think is the uh, some commissioner for the foreign policy or something. I have no idea. These people are not very well known in Europe either, by the way. Most Europeans would not know who Ursula von der Leyen is. A truly evil looking woman from Germany, of course. Uh, hey, hello from Bakersfield, California. Nice to meet you over here. Uh, thanks for sharing the live. Yuppie. So I was talking about, uh, you know, big geopolitical changes here. Hi from England. Hey. Uh, yeah. Benj so Israel's leadership, Benjamin Netanyahu, won't be able to travel as much anymore. Uh, just like Putin won't be able, isn't able to travel that much. Because h how, can, how can the EU continue doing business with Israel now? Now that uh, the leadership of Israel has been basically effectively convicted of, oh shit, <laughs> I kicked my uh, my camera stand. <laughs> All right, okay, problem. let me see. All right, uh, interesting, yeah. And so uh, the EU will have to like respect the International Court Criminal Court's decision, then, even though it's located in the Netherlands, and that means. I think that the United States working with the EU are going to try to delegitimize the criminal court, the ICC. They're going to disband it or dismantle it or somehow reduce whatever. 
they're going to do some kind of trickery. Maybe they will even assassinate one of the ICC judges. Uh, who knows, you know? Uh, oh, you got some of my right-wing book list. You're right. Uh, Death Object is on my must. Yeah, Death Object by the author Akio Nakatani. So when the war started with Russia two years ago, this is relevant. Remember, it could be a nuclear war. And so I wanted to know what are the actual nuclear warhead capabilities. Because in the Hollywood movies, you drop one bomb on, on New York City and the whole city blows up, like in the Roland Emmerich movies or something, right? Or in, uh, I don't know, those end of times cat catastrophe movies. And I, I had my doubts because I had studied warheads, nuclear warheads. There are supposed to be some nuclear warheads in, uh, in the Netherlands, in the province where I'm from, in the south of the Netherlands, uh, North Brabant. Uh, Fechel Airport, or I think that's what it was, yeah. And I looked at a whole study about these weapons, and they were small. They these so alleged nuclear bombs were the side of my desk, the size of my desk over here. You would strap uh, two, three, or four of them underneath the wings of an F-16 plane, right? And I thought, well, that's odd. So you, so they deliver those nukes via via jet planes, by the way. They don't use uh, rockets for those. And I thought, well, that's odd. Such a small thing. Does it, is that really an atom bomb? And so I went. I wanted to know the truth about nuclear weapons. And I came across this book by Akio Nakatani, the uh, a Japanese author, who uh, basically claims that nuclear weapons are a hoax, uh, a hoax invented by the British and the uh, and the Americans, to try to scare the world into adopting the rules-based order. So Akio Nakatani claims, for example, that. Um, you know, during the Second World War and right after the Second World War, the Americans under McNamara, Secretary of Defense McNamara, they basically firebombed most of the Japanese towns because they were built of wood. Even Tokyo and Kyoto were cities made of wood largely. So you have to imagine the world of Japan just 100 years ago. It would, it would have been wooden cities everywhere. Everything was made of wood. And they burnt these cities and they burnt the Japanese people alive in them. And so the... So Nakatani in the book Death Object claims that um, uh, the so-called bombs on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, were also uh, firebombs, napalm firebombs. And they, they do create this kind of plume effect, smoke plume effect that looks like a nuclear whatever, a nuclear effect. So I kind of, I kind of like quit believing the bomb. I don't believe the bomb anymore. I think it was a hoax. A very clever hoax where they also enlisted Albert Einstein uh, because Einstein said that a small atom can be spliced and releases such a gargantuan amount of energy, right? And uh, if atom bombs aren't real, then maybe we even need to question the, the formula E equals MC squared because I think maybe Einstein was, uh, was not who you think he was. Right? Maybe he was just a puppet, huh? Yeah, I love your... Uh, Love your comments. So let let me. Uh, oh, here's a pop up. I've got the pop up over here, so I can read your comments a bit more easily. Uh, all right. Where was I? All right. All right here. Okay. So much corruption. Yeah. So do you think the Mexican president is a communist? I don't know about Mexican president. Uh, I suppose I hope not for you. <laughs> Right, the Japanese are one of the people. Yeah, well, Japan, man, Japan has been uh, is being raided by with diversity as well, right? Uh, Japan. Have you heard this? Uh, the myth about the black samurai called Yasuki. There's a video game called Assassin's Creed Shadows that built a whole storyline around the black samurai Yasuki. First of all, the guy Yasuki wasn't a samurai. He was a page boy who lived in Japan for about three years. He was a servant to a samurai. He wasn't a samurai. And secondly, is it how likely do you think it is that in feudal Japan, a boy from West Africa got to Japan to be a page to a samurai? Right. Do you really believe that? No. It's because you have darker skinned Asians in Southeast Asia. So it's much more likely that a darker person from Southeast Asia got to Japan and was a page boy. And they turned that into a, we was samurai. We was kangs. We was historians, right? It's it's the same bullcrap over and over and over again. This Afrocentrist nonsense, I suspect, is being funded by the Global Open Societies, by George Soros and his son, Alex Soros. I say that because uh, I think a year back or so, 
Alex Soros announced that the Open Society Foundations were done working on Europe and they were now going to do other things. And I suppose this is the other thing they're doing. They're trying to rewrite Japanese history into making you believe that the ancient Japanese people were black people from Nigeria or something, right? I think it's just so weird why they would do that. I can't fathom why on earth would you want to do this? You know, you must have a true dark hatred of humanity to want to destroy and deconstruct people, their ethnicities and their cultures. And for what? For what end? You're burning money on it. So it's clearly not meant to make you money. You make money in other ways, apparently. But this is just psychopathic. I think the, the motives are purely uh, the motives are purely psychopathic. The Soros family are just uh, uh, a clan of super psychopaths, although I doubt that the son, Alex Soros, is that intelligent. He's quite stupid, actually. <laughs> Have you heard him speak at Davos? This was last year or this year at Davos in Switzerland, right? Davos is the highest town in Europe uh, in terms of elevation. Uh, so all the top minds think they need to go there. Right? A Heidegger used to speech there as well, have this have his philosophical debates there with uh, whoever. But, uh, you know, no. <laughs> Alex Soros is a dweeb, so he's not going to do anything, man. Uh, hold on. And so what we're going to do is, I think we can quite easily push back against this nonsense. I mean, I'm not Japanese and I like, I care about the Japanese people so much more that I don't want them to be replaced by Africans and, and mass immigration and whatever, even if their numbers are dwindling. I mean, come on, Japan has like more than 100 million people, but just 100 years ago, they would have had like 40 million. So how bad is it to drop back to 40 million? Same with Europe. Europe 100 years ago had maybe two or 300 million inhabitants, now 740 million. How bad is it if we would simply have our numbers and you could do it naturally, this is what aging demographics do we have these boomer generations that are going to naturally die off why don't we seize that opportunity to create some breathing space for ourselves um and there's a word for it i don't know to allow ourselves to relax our economies a little bit so that we no longer chase growth for say a few decades and instead of economic growth we grow personal growth our souls our minds i was i mentioned this to someone else today is that uh, hold on, that, uh, you know, you have money and wealth, but you also have time and space at some point in our economy. Well, let's say for a very long time, it paid to sell your time to your uh, corporation or to your work in exchange for the money, because the money could buy you freedom that you wanted to have. And you were willing to sacrifice having a big farm to living in a small apartment. You were sacrificing your space, right? To work for that corporation because the money was good enough it was it paid to work but it no longer pays to work that's my point people nowadays they want to have time time and space are real wealth yeah <laughs> katya mentioned this yeah it was your idea that's why i started talking about it but it's true uh, you know maybe uh, if you make a lot of money you will sacrifice your time and space but for most people this isn't true anymore we're not going to sacrifice our time and space Time to develop yourself, your mental desires, your talents, your skills, working with tools, you know, planning your future and so on, uh, analyzing your dreams, writing your novels and so on. To do these things as opposed to being a, a corporate slave or a worker slave or whatever, you know, um, that's, a, that's a real big problem here. Yeah. So, yeah, Alex Soros. <laughs> So yeah, they want to destroy cultural and national identities and, con and all connections, yeah. But it makes no sense in my view, whoever manages to overcome this, to withstand this leftist onslaught of our people, uh, they're going to be the survivors of this, this century. And this is why I think the Israeli Zionists, they are really hard on their own ethno-nationalism, right? They have the right to be ethno-nationalist, but no one else does, right? And I think if we Europeans somehow manage to rekindle our racial soul, our spirit, to be, to feel united as a people again, based on the fact that we are biologically kindred, we could be such a strong force. We would definitely secure our survival and possibly you know, stamp our stamp our name on the world and you know leave our mark. 
yeah, Davos being the highest town in Europe. Yeah, that's <laughs> great, great symbolism. Exactly. Uh, someone says that I'm angry. They're writing in Dutch. They think I'm angry because France was kicked out of Africa. Actually, I don't, couldn't care less about France. <laughs> you people don't understand me at all, man. Come on. Uh, France is a bit of a very problematic to uh, to the European people because Macron styles himself as the European emperor. And that's that's absolutely the wrong direction. Do you know why Germany is called Deutschland? Deutsch, the word Deutsch comes from Teuto, Teut, it to it Tudor from the Tudorberg forest. Tudo means uh, people. So Deutschland is the people's land, namely not the emperor's land. Uh, when in 1873, if I'm correct, uh, Otto von Bismarck united the Germanies, the many German princedoms and dukedoms and nations into one German nation. He did so specifically in opposition to the Holy Roman Empire that had collapsed earlier that century. And so he called Germany Deutschland to make it the land of the people, the people's land, not the emperor's land. And so Germanic peoples are like that. We are a bit more decentralized. We like smaller towns. We like quiet places. We don't want some French emperor with his old gay man lover pretending to be a woman to, to tell us what to do. No, I would be fine with France going bankrupt because I don't want to live in a Europe where France dominates Europe. If we're going to do anything at all, you know, it should be the Germanic nations. They should take the lead. We should rule the Europe. Or if you don't, or if the Europeans don't want us to rule them, which we'll is cut loose, we'll have the Northern European Union, then, the North, the Neuro, the NEU, the North European Union, and get rid of these people. Uh, you're here. This is Zionist agenda. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to read your comments because uh, uh, I enjoy it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about Black Egypt, man. That's that story is just everybody knows the truth. Yeah, you make electronic music on YouTube. OK, collab. OK, uh, send me a message or send me a demo or something. At uh, I have a YouTube at at the JMK music on my uh, YouTube. Richtig. <laughs> I want to get along and have mutually beneficial relationships with the Chinese, for example, not conflict. Yeah, we should have diplom diplomatic. The way I see it for Northern Europeans, the best possible outcome would be to have a diplomatic alliance with Russia, not to be dominated by the Russians. Right. Uh, but to have a diplomatic alliance with Russia and then connect our economies to the, uh, the Chinese, the Silk Road. Actually, I think the European Union should have started the Silk Road project itself. But we we allowed Beijing to start the Belt and Way uh, project, right? The Belt and Road project with their railroads and their harbors and ports all the way into Europe. They were trying to buy the Greek port of Petraeus. They were trying to buy a port or a harbor in, uh, in Italy. And in fact, you know what's funny? Because the Nord Stream pipeline was blown up by the British, it turns out, with the support of the Americans, obviously. Uh, German industry has felt, has been uh, forced to move and they've been moving a lot of their industry to countries like Hungary. And in Hungary, you have Chinese investors who are investing in these German businesses. And that's because Hungary still has access to the Turk stream pipeline from coming also coming from Russia. So it's it's mind boggling what is happening here. They're attacking the West German industry, but as a, but the result is just that Germany is moving its industry to Hungary and Eastern Europe where they can have cheap gas. And, and they do so with the help of Chinese investments. I mean, what was the plan again of the Americans? What was their grand vision here? They wanted to s disconnect Europe from Russia and China, right? But you're only pushing Europe or at least Germany into Chinese arms this way. This, this makes no sense, man. Make it make sense. Re revive the Spanish Empire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Germanic people like autonomy. Yeah, I definitely, definitely agree with that. All right, you digger. Yeah, we're reviving the Silk Road, yeah, with railroads. I was thinking also of uh, the Zeppelins, the airships. You know, the Germans pioneered the airships, right? And they actually used those airships to fly all the way to Brazil during the Nazi era, right, the 1930s, and to New York City and so on. And then the Americans refused to sell the Germans 
uh, helium gas. And then the Germans were forced to switch to hydrogen gas, which is explosive. And then they, they sail safely without any accidents. They sail all the way back to New York on hydrogen. And then you have the big Hindenburg Zeppelin disaster. The Hindenburg disaster, they say, was an accident. But of course, it might as well have been an, an act of American terrorism uh, to destroy the German Zeppelin project. You know why Zeppelins were so freakishly important, actually? If you have Zeppelins, you can also sail across Eurasia and, and the inland of Africa. You could connect inland Africa with inland Eurasia, for example. You can sail from Berlin over Moscow to Vladivostok to China, overland. You would unlock the land. So Zeppelins are the ships of the land. You have the ships at sea, right? So the British, they control the seas with their trade routes. Even today, the American and British control a lot of the sea tra trade route. Uh, this is how it's called mercantilism. They are merchants and that's how they get rich. But the Germans were about to compete with this British idea of ships by building Zeppelins. And with the Zeppelins, they could have sailed to, to Siberia for, to, to get wood and timber, for example, and, and fly it back over cheaply because that's the point of the Zeppelins is the low cost, right? No hydrogen this time. That's right. We got to gotta have helium. Now, there are some, I, I looked into this, and there's some French companies working on a new generation of Zeppelins now. They seem to be very properly working. But, of course, uh, we need to do this. We Everybody, it just doesn't make sense not to use Zeppelins. With Zeppelins, you can sail across the land masses. And you can, for example, imagine this. You have a railroad from Moscow to Vladivostok in the east, right? But there are very few... Um, branches out north and south but with zeppelins you can go anywhere and then you can supply the railroads with with timber with resources materials even people and workers and whatever you can reach those valleys where you can normally not go you can't there are places in in uh, norway during the winter that snow over the passes snow over so you can't get out with the car there's still such places in scandinavia but with zeppelins you could go anywhere you could always go anywhere all right, so that's why I think Zeppelins are so uh, so important here. All right, I'm going to try to read your uh, comments again. You know. Oh, you messaged me? Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, this is so beyond. Yeah, you know, I, I often uh, think about the future. That's why I come up with these visions that people find strange a little bit because People ask me, what's your source? Well, there is no source because I'm thinking of the future. There's, a, there's no sources there yet. Yeah? But I'm trying to figure out, you know, where do we go? Where do we go next from here? Because I don't want to be a prisoner of this industrial urban complex. The European Union does not serve our people's interests, clearly. Right? We want to have some form of ethno-nationalism, but I also oppose overpopulation. So how are we going to deal with if hundreds of millions of Africans will want to come to Europe, I'd say we just declare war. So we have to think of all, the thi all of these things. Like, are we going to go to war with the Africans now and with the Islam as well? You know, we need an ally. And who are going to be our allies? I would like the white Americans to be our allies and the Canadians, right? And the white Russians perhaps as well. So the, we would have a northern front to withstand both Islam and Africa. But, you know. I don't know if that's going to be possible. We're going to have to explore these options. So that's why I talk about these things, you know. If someone is both Norwegian and German, well, then they're both Germanic. So it's kind of okay. That, <laughs> right? I'm half Germanic, half Celtic. It turns out I have, ans I took my DNA test, right? So it turns out I have ancestors from before the Roman age who were living in Southwest England near Bath, where they have these hot springs. So yeah, uh, I call myself Kelto-Germanic. Yeah, I suppose uh, we'll do it like that. <laughs> I'm Kelto-Germanic. You're Norse-Germanic, though. You're an old, Nor you're old Norse or Norse-Germanic, whatever you want to call yourself, man. <laughs> uh, you're from Norway and your father's German. German. Well, technically, you're Germanic, though, right? Yeah, call yourself Norwegian, you yeah. Zeppelin drones, that would be extraordinary. Yeah, you can just program these Zeppelins to fly all around, yeah. Twelve kilometers from Moscow, I don't know. My your family have a hundred percent Irish DNA. Alright, pretty cool, all right. All right. 
All you need is a Coast Guard that returns rafts to Algeria. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be so hard. It, you just need to want to do it. And that's the problem with our political leadership in Europe. European Union leadership is just so treasonous. They're such bad people. Man. It's just uh, unbelievable. Ban usury. Usury, that's a good idea. What do you think about Iran's president who died? Yeah, I don't know. Is it an accident? Could be. People are talking about it's another Franz Ferdinand moment where we're going to start World War III now. But I think that the presidents of all these nations are not that important, right? Uh, although Putin is, yeah, Putin is uh, very important because you get the impression that Putin is in charge of Russia. That's why I say that. Whereas someone like Olaf Scholz of Germany is clearly not in charge of anything. So that's it. Um, All right, all right, all right. I've heard of Leon de Grel, yeah. He was this guy who, uh, the Belgian uh, fascist leader, right? Who spoke, when you hear him speak, he speaks like a lion roaring. And I like that. I like that extreme masculinity. But I also think that the, he was supposed to be backed by the Catholic Church, if I'm not wrong. And then the Catholic Church eventually betrayed him or something. That's why. Either way, I think Leon de Grel uh, said a lot of good things, yeah. Yeah, smuggling people into Europe should be punishable, yeah. But also, countries should stop feeling guilty for... If you have a lot of migrants and the war is over, say they come from Syria, the war, say, say assume the war in Syria is over, then they should be sent back. And don't say we can't do that, because now we have a war in Ukraine, and countries like the Netherlands and Germany are considering of sending back the Ukrainian men so they have to fight the war. And that's while there is still a war. So how come, how come we can send Ukrainian men back to Ukraine to make them fight the war, but we somehow can't send black people back to their safe countries where there is no war. This isn't right. This is the real discrimination. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, We have to get over this. Why is it that these Western countries always feel so guilty about everything? Just quit feeling guilty, right? And just send them back, you know? The war is over. You need to rebuild your country. Go back, you know? What's the problem? It's not like we didn't want to help. We're, I mean, the, the money we're spending on housing you in hotels in Europe, if we'd spend that money on rebuilding your country, you would have Wakanda. Yeah, talking about doc documentaries, I hope everybody watches the documentary uh, Empire of Dust. It's about China's presence in East Africa. Empire of Dust. It means... Uh, it really shows you how the Chinese are in charge of the blacks there, just like we were. It's, it's just so interesting to see that the black people in East Africa are just the employees of the Chinese, but they're not the management. Is it Empire of Dirt? I thought it was Empire of Dust. Yeah, the best films ever made, because it just shows you the truth. No one can deny the truth anymore, you know? Yeah, they want, to f want us to feel guilty, yeah. Yeah, it's dust, right? It's dust. All right. I'm going to open up some uh, zero hedge to see if I can come up with topics. Because I, I tried to fill an hour on my live streams, right? So I've been speaking for a half an hour now. Yeah, gold and silver are booming. Yeah, it's really a good movie here. Yeah. Oh, what do I think of Turkey and Erdogan? Is he a good leader? Well, he's a good leader for the Turkish people. But I, and it, this was revealed to me in a dream, by the way, I think that Erdogan is secretly an ally of Russia. Imagine an alliance between Russia, Turkey, and Iran, and they decide to go to war with Europe. We're fucked, basically. Because Turkey alone has half a million soldiers, although they're supposed to be in NATO. And of course, Turkey, Turkey plays both sides, right? Turkey plays. That's what small countries always do. They play, they play the West to see what they can get. And they play the East to see what they can get. Right. And so they play all sides to maximize their own benefit, which is understandable. But that also means that there could be a point in time where uh, Turkey will side with Russia openly. And I think they are secretively anyway, an ally of Russia. So that might cause uh, 
a bit of a problem here, you know. So, uh, uh, talk about the Netherlands in 100 years. If it were up to me, the Netherlands in 100 years will be a very nice place to live, yeah. But it will be uh, full of white people again, yeah. Yeah, many comments being removed by the community rules. It's annoying, yeah. Yeah, I know. What's your opinion of Southern Mediterranean people? Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, France. Yeah, you know what's strange? When I, I visited Greece several times in my life, and I always see just white people. And then other people tell me they look like uh, Pakistanis or something. And it's like, huh? what are you talking about? Not in Athens, not where I was. Even the bums looked white in, in Greece to me. Although I did see the, the immigrant neighborhoods in uh, around Athens, around the Acropolis, you have some neighborhoods that are indeed full of Pakistani people. Maybe that's the difference. I think the original Greek people were white people. And turns out, turns out the original founders of Rome were also uh, descendants of the uh, Pontic Steppe pastoralists, the Aryans. They were white people, you know. I think it's just that southern Italy and southern Spain have had a lot of uh, Arab immigration over the centuries. And you notice that. You can see that southern Italy, like Barry, they're very different. All right, they're very different people. But the uh, the northern Italians and, uh, you know, when I go to Barcelona, I think they're just white people. Like, you know, it depends, you know. I can't really change the reality. It's just how it is. Right, and Turkey would fight Greece as well, yeah. Right, exactly. There, there's no way that Turkey has any aspirations to fulfill their role as a NATO member. That's exactly what I think, yeah. It, they're just playing all sides to see what they can get, but it, ultimately I think they're a natural ally of uh, of uh, the Chechens and, uh, and Iran and so on and of Syria. They're not going to... They're going to fight the West. They're not on our side. They're, they're a Muslim nation. They're... A, they abolished their democracy to turn it into an Islamist totalitarian state. So what do you want, you know? What do I think about generic people? Well, I suppose they're European, right? <laughs> Ancient Egyptians have 80% Celtic genes. Wow. Why do I think they let Turkey and NATO? Well, chess. The geopolitical chess game requires us to have Turkey on our side. So we promise them uh, inclusion into the European Union, right? And, and it's, it's a large, a very long-term bullshit game where we try to bullshit the Turks into siding with us, but we're not really going to allow them to enter the European Union. Maybe someday, maybe not, right? And so we're playing with that. Uh, yeah, like I said, they're just Turkey is just maximizing its own interests, which is understandable. But they're definitely not an ally of Europe. They would, they would want to make Europe Islamic, to conquer Europe and to submit Europe to Islam. That's what they would really. That's what Erdogan, Erdogan would really want, right? Uh, yeah, amazing how multiculturalism has been destroying diversity. Right, true diversity is not. Yeah, right, right. Because you know, European peoples were always extremely diverse in and of ourselves. And to replace us with the same kind of migrants over and over again, that's not adding diversity. It's not making us diverse, you know. Oh, right, right. Uh, I suppose you can also subscribe to my newsletter at jmk.info. Don't know if I can type that in here. Maybe it gets censored, huh? No, you can see it, right? Right, right. Turkey in the EU would give another 80 million Muslims the right to live in our country. Yeah. Uh, pretty bad, yeah. I support the the white Russian people because they're very orthodox Christian. And this is probably their morality and their attitude is what we need in Europe to reinvigorate ourselves. But that doesn't mean I support the Eurasianist philosophy of Dugin or someone. And Putin is probably a globalist as well, you know. Putin is probably going to uh, work with China because they think that's what they need to do to destroy the West. Personally, I would like to see an alliance between Europeans and the white Russians. Uh, and then we make Europe, Northwestern Europe, Northern Europe, the economic powerhouse of the world. You know, everybody's always fighting for their own self-interest. I mean, why shouldn't we at some point, you know?
we only wanted Turkey and NATO because we didn't want the Soviets to grab them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The Black Hundreds from Russia are based here. All right. I'm looking at Zero Hedge. Actually, I want to talk about some case. Uh, remember the gay cake guy? It's a guy, uh, I think his name was Jack Phillips in the USA. He was the guy who the, the media told you refused to bake gay, gay people a cake. There was a gay couple. They wanted to have a cake from a, a cake store, a, a wedding cake. And somehow the media told you that this guy refused to make them a cake or sell them a cake even, right? That didn't happen. Uh, the guy actually, so the, the gay couple requested this guy to create for them gay art to put on a cake and he refused to do that and then they sued him as though he ref right uh but this is exactly what i think is so important about our world is that if you're an artistic person artistic you should not be forced by any outside force to create art you don't want to create and that's the difference here between you know you have these the lgbt mafia they want to impose uh their degenerate lifestyle onto others like it's like if i would go to a gay architect and i asked them would you uh make me a building in the in the in the in the shape of a swastika right he might not want to do that maybe he would say no right would i would you be able to sue them for that for because they disrespected my politics and this is the same thing you're you're saying that someone has to make you gay art because of what you know if if this guy the, the guy who bakes the cakes you should watch his art because it's really good if he were a painter like vincent van gogh or something or um i don't know whoever <laughs> if he were a painter on canvas you'd call him a genius and no one would call him anything else but because he puts his art on cakes and sells them all of a sudden they uh they sue him they keep suing him they go after him you know and that's just pure evil we need to have a, a sense of normalcy in our heads again in our countries again where you can do whatever the hell you want in your uh, your private little lifestyle, but you can't impose it on others, and you can't use the court systems to go after people who don't support your lifestyle. And that's just just weird, you know. That's why people start hating them. That's why you start hating the LGBT clan, because they are they are they're just abusive. They're just literally raping society with their nonsense, doing things that nobody asked for and nobody wanted to be a part of. Right? It's just awful. I don't know who Marcus Fallon is. Yeah, social media also. But you know what I've noticed? A lot of in Europe, right? A lot of these political people, even at the uh, provincial level and municipal level, they are uh, heavy on the LGBT spectrum, man. You have shit eaters and pedophiles. It's just so fucking weird. A German mayor was arrested just for three years in jail for uh, raping a bunch of teenagers and putting it online. I mean, it's just bizarre why we don't uh why can't we do anything about this you know yeah do you think there's any place for monarchy in a modern europe yeah definitely we should have a sort of uh, a fighting nobility a new aristocracy willing to win wars for the people so that we uh you know the whole idea of a republic an ethno-nationalist state a republic that stands up for its own interests and for the well-being of its people to make ourselves healthy strong and fertile again and reproductive again and also and also in culture and in art and so on and in the experience of having an adventurous life again where we face danger and overcome it that's what we really want right and then we have a, a, a role for nobility not a ceremonial role but a leading role they need to show people how to do it it's just so important yeah, democracy is a scam here. Yeah. I've heard of the Golden Worm. I thought he was a part of the alt-right movement, and I don't trust those people, like Lauren Simonson or Lauren Southern or whoever, those people. I don't trust them at all, so. How would you solve... Israel and Palestine, I would turn my back to both of them. I wouldn't want to have anything to do with them, you know? All right. Well, I haven't seen any of his videos, so uh, 
all I know about is uh, years ago, uh, during the alt-right years of the before TikTok existed, that's why that's when I heard of him. That's all really. So does it even matter if we vote at this point in European elections? No, I don't think it matters at all because of the the they're, they're starting Ursula von der Leyen, the EU uh, high priestess, which she's starting a she's starting a, a European disinfo shield or something. They want to ban all content they don't like in Europe. So they're going to ban all everything that they deem disinformation is going to be shut down. So very likely that means that I will disappear. If they're really going to do this, I will disappear from the internet because they're going to ban me and censor me in every possible way. Maybe, maybe by denying you internet access or something, something really weird they might do. So I have to start learning about uh, how to hack my way back into the internet. Right. Right. And so I think the European Union is just catastrophically desperate at this point because they need to somehow support Israel because the U.S. tells them to do that. Right. And they need to, like, fight Russia. But it, it's it, Russia's winning. Russia won the war in eastern Ukraine. Basically, I've been I've been calling this for two years now. They won the war because the Ukrainian people were, are not motivated. They're they're uneducated. Effectively, they're sending their stupidest men to the front lines to die. And those men, they get two two days of training. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't know anything about warfare. They're not trained specialists. Right? It's such an incredible waste of human life. And then Russia wins anyway. After you lost half a million men, Russia wins anyway. Okay. Uh, the EU is the puppy is a puppy of a puppy dog of the of the of the U.S. system, the U.S. empire, and that's just wrong. We need to have our own independence here in Europe. This is very important. We need autonomy and independence here. No more brother wars, yeah. Yeah, we need to create some pan-European thing, yeah. But it will be for our people, not for immigrants, right? It's for ourselves. We're going to put ourselves back on the map. You're right, the Ukrainian leader is, uh, yeah, <laughs> I know. A small hat. So Russia has been practicing conscription, yeah. They're more prepared, yeah. We needed those Ukrainian men to replace immigrants in Europe. But why, why should we? I mean, it's better to have East European immigrants than uh, African immigrants, right? So. All right. Trying to catch up on the news a little bit here. All right. Julian Assange wins high court victory in temporary reprieve from extradition to the U.S. Okay, well, that's not very interesting, right? Yeah. H have you uh, heard of that, uh, the Apple visor thing, selling for 3,500 euros or so, and nobody wants one anymore? After the initial uh, TikTok hype, fake hype, because it was... Uh, organic marketing right it's fake and then uh, nobody wants it anymore i noticed so much the whole so alleged uh u.s tech industry or the western tech industry it's at a dead end man you have like a uh, millions and millions of young guys working on the latest app and that no one will ever use it's such an incredible vast waste of talent of human talent you would want to redirect the whole effort of silicon valley towards some other goals that are very different for example uh guerrilla pastoralism or something or how to terraform new how to terraform the subarctic for example that's what we should be thinking about how do we turn the subarctic region into habitable land that would be the inland of greenland siberia uh large parts of canada and alaska how do we make those cold parts habitable to our people that's what we should be innovating for, not for some stupid app to do your accounting in a better way or to have a new way to do email. That's not what we're waiting for, dude. We're waiting for how can we have, how can we expand our territory and secure a future for our people while still eating meat, right? And having more fun doing it, right? That's what we're, we're, really, we're really after, right? Uh, do I like Serbia? Yeah, kind of. I think I've been there once on the way through. Right. I think I've been to Belgrade for half a day or so, yeah. Oh, you follow Anthony Michels. Yeah, I know him from t yeah, from Twitter, yeah. 
I've been in touch with him sometimes, yeah. Uh, on Twitter, of course. And, uh, so I like some of his ideas, creating local currencies. Yes. Yeah. Look, we can stop building new apps for the Apple Visor and for your new iPhone and for Android and so on. We really need to start start thinking about securing a future for our people. And that means making more land habitable to our people, moving our people there as pioneers to do homesteading, off-the-grid living, to do guerrilla pastoralism, to figure out new kinds of agriculture and innovate in that way so that we can, you know, make our people strong again, but also offer our people a whole new future to look forward to. Because getting stuck in your office is not the future, man. Spending 80 hours of your week doing corporate accounting is not the purpose of life, man. My favorite Heidegger book is Was Heist Denken? What is Called Thinking? But you should read uh, Ernst Jünger. I like Ernst Jünger's books uh, on uh, war as an inner experience and The Forest Passage and Storm of Steel. Do you know these ones? Here, I'll type the name. Ernst Jünger. And the book on pain. Yeah, On Pain also by Ernst Jünger. Yeah. These are really good books. Um, it's it's so far, these books, On Pain and um, uh, War as an Inner Experience, they are so far removed from the liberal, progressive nonsense you've been fed. It's like almost like, wow, you didn't know this even existed, that people could even have these kinds of opinions. Because those opinions that you read in those books, man, they're, uh, it's like, we would call it, not even toxic mass masculinity nowadays, we would call it like, hyper toxic evil masculinity and he presents it as the perfectly normal thing to do right? <laughs> to overcome the fear of death that's step number one that's every man's job overcome the fear of death and then uh, face face your enemies in the outside world and i'm going to do that too and I spend the rest of my life I'm going to try to do exactly that yeah yeah i rec recommended the forest passage it's a really good book you can probably find an ebook ebook version somewhere because i think these are uh they're not in copyright anymore. I don't know. Well, you'll see. All right, all right, all right. With climate change, Europe might become colder. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping for it, looking forward to it. We can use Father Winter as a great defense against African immigration because if it gets too cold, and of course the cost of energy is going to go up, we won't be able to afford heating. We're, we're going to have to send a lot of immigrants back home. They will not be able to stay here. And we can turn Europe into something else. It doesn't have to be this economic zone anymore or a market. It could be a place where human beings live life to the fullest, full, full of excitement, right? Uh, not just to make money or uh, to pop out kids, but to have the experience of knowing what it's like uh, to have felt everything, to have felt the world in a sense, right? Burning Souls by De Grel. I'm going to look that one up, yeah. Yeah, of all the books I've read, I must have read more than 1,300 books or so in my life. And I thought the ones by Ernst Jünger, Ernst Jünger were just absolutely the best, you know. Right, right, right. In, in wintertime, European cities that look less diverse, yeah. It's so funny. I could tell you stories, man. I'm waiting for the bus and there's a bank behind me. And they have an indoor area with some ATM machines. And there's like black people waiting indoors because it's too cold outside. And they're wearing these thick ski, ski jackets like, okay. <laughs> or uh, I was in Iceland once doing a tour around the island. I went all around Iceland. It was pretty awesome to do that. Uh, I went to Akurairi in the north and so on, right? And uh, of course, Reykjavik and uh, oh, all sorts of places but there is a there was this black guy uh, african-american and uh he was uh like shivering in his hotel waiting for the bus to come while i was waiting outside right and he got into the bus with me he spoke to me he said he was going to do a winter hike through some pass and later i read i read up on this hiking trail because i like hiking as well and it says like every year like one or two white people die there because it's so freaking cold and difficult so <laughs> Like, what was he thinking, man? What was he thinking? He couldn't even stand the regular cold uh, in front of the hotel. Imagine if he actually did went did go on that hike. I doubt he would have survived it. So it's really funny. What do we do with the zebras? I don't know. Domesticate them. Yeah, reading books makes you smart, but then also, yeah, you need to start making decisions as well, right? 
we need to go start a movement somehow, take over. Uh, we can't allow this old women's matriarchy to oppress original thinking. We need that original thinking to come out on the internet so that people can find each other, you know? Right? You can't see your comment. I see this one. Yeah, and Jonathan Bowden here. Yeah, we need to start doing things. Exactly, we need to start doing things. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try. You know, set something up. Yeah. I want that activity, the action. Yeah. Oh, zebra are mixed stripe, mixed race people. Oh, okay, I didn't know that word yet. We need to start connecting the real world. You know. Julius Evola, someone told me, someone gave me a quote from Julius Evola. He was like a Roman Catholic Italian traditionalist. Uh, he wrote about fascism from the right. So he was a very far right person. Uh, he mentioned most people, 80% of people are like uh, sandbags that you can move around depending on the political change. And I, I mentioned this. I call it the uh, the dead humanity theory. You've heard of the dead internet theory, right? There's like so many websites where there is no one there. It's empty, like ghost towns. Like Reddit, for example, feels like a ghost town to me. Uh, and then you have uh, the dead humanity theory is that 80% of humanity like are NPCs. They have nothing, nothing going on inside them. They just follow orders. And if you change the political system, they'll follow the new orders. They don't care. They're standbacks. You can move them from one place to another depending on your politics. And so we shouldn't worry too much about convincing those people. What we should worry about is somehow driving out those people who are perceived as being in power and then replace us with them, with ourselves. We simply seize power, take over, drive out these weirdos, the LGBT mafia, for example, you know, and, uh, and start doing what we want to do. I think it's a lot easier than you think, you know. If you, if you can just be organized and get something done, I think it would be a lot easier than we suspect. It's just that you need to know how to do it. So we're going to work on that, right? We're going to work on doing our own uh, a military coup or something. Right, right. Basically, most normies are quite racist anyway because they like diversity on at the workplace, but not in their private life. Their friends are all white, see? Most of them, right? So that's how it is, right? Here, someone said, yeah, we live in a feminine world here. It's it's because I think the old women feminists, like the 60-year-old, 70, like Ursula von der Leyen, those ones, they hate people. They hate their own children probably. And it's just, I don't see how we can go on with them. This, this is wrong. They treat, they treat us as though we are children who need to be educated, right? That's why, that's why they say that, because they really see us as though we are children who need to be educated. And you, you can't say bad words. You can't say this word or that word. You know? It's so restrictive, really. It's so strange also. We need to overthrow these old women and just, you know. Yeah, you only need 10% for a revolution, probably less, right? Because with, if you use the internet or to amplify your movement, then I don't think you need 10%. You could do it with 0.1 and amplify yourself 100 times over. Yeah. I mean, I was reading about how Lenin did his revolution in 1917. And the, the Lenin, Leninists and Lenin and his supporters... They didn't have the internet, right? So they had to keep the revolution a secret. But on the day of their revolution, it was published in all the major newspapers. Like everybody knew it was going to happen. So it doesn't matter. So you just need to do it. Because most people don't do anything. They will be at home reading about it in the news. They're not even going to stop you. Most people won't. So if you get like most of the military and most of the police forces on your side for something like that, or even if you just get the police forces to look the other way for one one afternoon, you could take over. It could be that easy. You really should, yeah. You know. Yeah, the October Revolution was a small coup. It was it was it reads like a bunch of amateurs who hardly knew what the hell they were doing, and they were just lucky that it worked out or something. Right? <laughs> if that's how it is, then we we need to seriously consider our possibilities here. You know, we just need to imagine it and do it. 
Oh, you ordered my books and you sent them to leaders in Silicon Valley. That's that's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, they're trying to rewrite history as well. Yeah, they do that all the time. But then that means we'll do that too. We'll also rewrite history. We will rewrite it the way we want it to be. You know, men need to be men again. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not so sure if you need wealth and status to gather numbers. What I think you need is you need specialists. You need certain. If you had like a thousand, uh, of the best. Green Berets, Commandos, and so on. Such kind of specialists. If you have a thousand of them with leadership, I think you could take over Brussels with less than a thousand of them. You need specialists. That's my that's my view. Specialists who are really good at this shit. You know. Six million reps in four sets. <laughs> Depends on how many how much coal you can acquire. Right, Karl Marx did, did more than 10,000 soldiers. Aaron. Probably did, yeah. Yeah, well, they ain't cheap, but maybe they need to do it for freedom, right? You can promise them something for the outcome. <laughs> all right uh dresden bombing yeah i heard it yeah of course there's a book by an american author called uh, slaughterhouse five <clears throat> slaughterhouse five uh i think they deflated the numbers the actual number was probably like half a million innocent women and children you know they saw they say that the fires were so hot that you had entire streets full of liquid fat from the human bodies because they did it with napalm right you know uh, absolute absolute war crime but it wasn't just Dresden; it was also Würzburg and Nuremberg and many other cities were bombed to shit you know what's my opinion on Christianity we need a sort of revivalist Christianity that focuses on masculinity uh, and that allows men to be warriors and fight for their their faith and their people again I do definitely embrace like something like the Catholic morality as a good starting point a good ideal for the common people right and hamburg as well yeah uh, someone asked me a question here how do you think iran will react after the death of their president uh if they think it was an accident if it was a real accident they might do nothing but if they suspect that secret services did it if the west is behind it then this is a Franz ferdinand moment and we're entering world war three Do you think European laws are too much welcoming Muslims? Yeah, absolutely. The whole multiculturalism is just nonsense. We basically, in the, in the 2000s, we started removing Christian crosses from public spaces to make our spaces uh, uh, open to other faiths. But we should never have done that. We even removed the Christian cross. There was a red cross on the red cross cars. Like the ambulances used to have a red cross on them. We removed that because Muslims were attacking the ambulances. We should have removed those Muslims, right? This is unacceptable, man. If you you are you welcome foreign people to live in your land and then they attack your 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 religious symbols in your own land, we should have removed them, like without without question, without remorse, no regrets. You know, it's unacceptable. The fact that we did that, that we cowered and and submitted to the aggression of small groups of other men that we could have easily gotten rid of, unfathomable. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so Christianity can be interpreted in many ways. And, you know, the New Testament is really about submitting, you know, subjecting, turn the other cheek. And I don't like that. You need to, you know, tell Christ to be a man again in this sense, to fight back. But you can do that. You can just take Christianity as a starting point. And that's just because people are like that, you know. Yeah, people accuse me of saying that the, the sort of Christianity I promote is like heathen Christianity. But yeah, I want uh, our people to be strong again, and I'll use whatever I can do for it, you know. All right, all right, all right, all right. 
I was looking up Burning Souls by Leon de Graal. Let's see if there's some good reviews. The Burning Souls by Leon de Graal. Okay. Ah, de Grel rose to prominence as a newspaper editor and the head of a militant monarchist. Head of the militant monarchist, the Catholic and anti-communist party, Parti Rexiste. Ah, he was a monarchist. Okay, yeah, I get that. A Catholic monarchist, anti-communist. I probably would have liked a lot of his uh, beliefs, yeah. And following the German occupation of Belgium, de Grel and his party loyalists enlisted in the Wehrmacht, in the Walloon Legion, to aid the liberation of the peoples of the Soviet republics. Okay. That's very interesting, yeah. What do you think? Is Catholic monarchism the answer for Europe, yes or no? Antelope Hill, okay. Yeah, pe population of cattle, but I suppose you can't really change the normies. I spoke about the dead humanity theory. I think so many people are, uh, they're just helpless. They're just, you just tell them what to do. And if you keep your hands off their wives and daughters, they'll, they will just do whatever you tell them to do. Yeah, I've, I've read some of Renaud Camus here. Yeah. He's right, of course, yeah. I read Thus Spoke Zarathustra too, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's start with something else. Uh, Nietzsche, when he was young, he wrote a whole treatise of Prometheus. The, the fire bringer, the gift of God, the, the gift of fire, like Prometheus sent fire to, to the, uh, to the humans. Basically the gift, the gift of fire is, uh, it means intelligence. We got our intelligence from Prometheus. And so Nietzsche identifies with Prometheus personally. Right. And so he, he sees himself as a Prometheus and he writes down this book about Zarathustra coming down from the hill, bringing intelligence to the, to the locals there. Right. Um, uh, Der Zaltanzer, yeah. Uh, I think Martin Heidegger commented also on the on the Zaltanzer. What do you call it? The rope walker. Is that it? The rope walker. Some guy like an acrobat walks a rope, right? Uh, it's the idea of going over to the other side, but then uh, the other side is the divine world, the spiritual world. And, and this stuff goes extremely deep, by the way. Like, if you start reading Heidegger, Nietzsche, and so on, uh, Heidegger mentions this concept of jumping twice. So you jump up into the air, and then you jump again. How do you do that? Uh, he leaves you with the question, and you're supposed to figure it out. Uh, my, my, what I tried to figure out with that was, how do you jump and jump again? So, well, you jump in the physical world, and then the second time you jump in the mental world, uh, meaning you enter the, the sphere of cosmic powers where you use the undefined forces of of basically uh, the non-existent darkness but you use that as a as a force of renewal to create and recreate the material world okay this is <laughs> this is a bit too far-fetched maybe might is right yeah i love the, love the title yeah i think i must have read it yeah heidegger said humor was the embodiment of the ubermensch really very interesting yeah should our morals be subjective only to ourselves, right? We mean we will accept that other people have different morals, but that ours are still the best for us, right? Heidegger is very difficult. That's why I recommend Ernst Jünger, who, who was in contact with Heidegger. I think a lot of Heidegger's beliefs are more easily explained in Ernst Jünger's books. Heidegger is very hard to read. Yeah, I know. Thoughts on Carl Jung? Yeah, I... I appreciate Carl Jung's uh, works very, very much as well. Yeah, Carl Jung, Heidegger, and Nietzsche, they, you know, you can call them Judeophiles or in some way, but I think they are, uh, they were right about a lot. And we're going to, we're going to tap into that to uh, build a framework for ourselves. Right? 
or something that's useful to us here. All right, all right. I've been speaking for more than an hour now. Usually I wrap it up, though. I do have a Telegram group. It's at JohannesMK. I also have a, a Twitter. X is my JohannesMKX, if you want to go there. And I have my uh, newsletter at jmk.info. Uh, and uh, I'll do this. Uh, I'll do this once a week or so. I'll do it again next week or maybe later this week. I don't, I'm sorry I don't have a schedule for my lives because it depends on what I have in my head. If I feel like I can do an hour, then I'll do a live stream. Otherwise, I, uh, uh, I think in my TikTok bio, I have... Uh, oh, I put a different link. All right. Now I'll change the link sometime. Uh, yeah, you can go to... Uh, what's it called? Uh, link in bio slash JohannesMK. Link in bio slash JohannesMK. I think you will find all my links there. And then uh, see you around, and I'll up, I'll upload this to my YouTube. Also at the great at the great Johannes. Yeah, <laughs> my usernames are different everywhere because I get banned so often. I can't get the same username back anymore, and that's why I get stuck with it. So that's my. I'll put this on my YouTube. And uh, all right, see you guys uh, soon. Bye bye.